the uh, next session is uh, about to begin. And uh, before we start, I would just like to say that uh, John Wallace has kindly um, provided us with some graphs, uh, very interesting graphs um, about gold and et cetera, et cetera, that are going to be available on that uh, back, uh, one of the back tables, uh, if you want to look at it, or take one later, I assume. But um, it's, uh, it's very interesting information. Um, the professor is going to um, give, uh, give his talk, and uh, in accordance with popular demand, uh, which we always adhere to, we're going to have an extended um, question and answer period as long as we want to talk, to, or if we're running too far into lunch, we'll cut it off again. But anyway, Professor Fekete. Thank you, Daryl. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start with uh, following up on what Rudy Fritsch had to say about money and gold. And he mentioned that one concept of the gold standard is for the what I would call the unadulterated gold standard is zero fiduciary component and the rest is gold component but that splits two ways one is uh, physical gold and the other is co commercial paper maturing into gold and that's what commonly called uh, real bills now I'm going to elaborate on the concept of unadulterated gold standard. <clears throat> and in order to do that, I start with the concept of illicit interest arbitrage, because another way of defining an unadulterated gold standard is that illicit interest arbitrage is ruled out. It's outlawed. It's made a criminal offense, as cooking the book of a firm is a criminal offense. So also what I define as illicit interest arbitrage is, has to be made a criminal offense. Might add that that was one of the mistakes which the original fathers of the gold standard, among them Isaac Newton of Britain, but there are other important people also, Adam Smith and so on, failed to do. They did not see the danger that the gold standard could be torpedoed by illicit interest arbitrage. So what is illicit interest arbitrage? That concept in turn has to do with the concept of the yield curve. The rate of interest depends on the maturity date of the loan. If the loan is arranged for a long term, the rate of interest will be higher. Uh, the short-term loan will carry with it a lower rate of interest. That is a natural uh, phenomenon because with time the risk involved in any loan will increase. The longer the maturity, the more risk is there for something untoward to happen, which will uh, or could frustrate the repayment of the loan. So naturally, the creditors will charge a risk premium, and this shows up as a higher rate of interest. So, I think just as well to 
draw a little chart showing this. normal coordinate system. The horizontal axis is time to maturity. And the vertical axis is the percentage uh, rate of interest, annual rate, on the loan, which is being charged. Right. And what you have is a rising curve. It doesn't rise indefinitely because there is a, a limit which you might call the console rate. Now a console is a, a bond in perpetuity. It has no maturity date. It, uh, it's not a, an abstract concept because the British, British government used to issue them when it had the credit standing. Now, since it lost its credit standing, it is no longer able. I'm sure they would love to issue them. <laughs> <laughs> In the United States, they were a little bit wiser because the United States never issued perpetual debt. I'm sure Ben Bernanke would love to do that, but it's too late because the United States Constitution uh, ruled it out. Not as if they pay too much attention. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the word "council" was the British term for a perpetual bond, bond without maturity. So. This was the highest interest, and anything with a finite maturity date carried a lower interest rate. And what came out as a result is known as the normal yield curve. Now, you might ask the question what the normal yield curve is under the gold standard. And the answer is that it's not this. If you mean by yield curve, you mean the interest rate on bonds. And there's a very interesting reason for that, which I would like to explain to you. <coughs> I'm reviving an old concept which the world hasn't used for the past uh, at least 50 years, but probably longer. Honesty. No. <laughs> you are close. <laughs> but actually, the term is called sinking fund. Beautiful. But it's it's close enough, closely related to honesty. Because traditionally, under the gold standard, up to 1930 or so, gold bonds were issued by governments and companies, the private sector as well. But a self-respecting company, if it issued a bond, it created at the same time a sinking fund. And the purpose of the sinking fund was to keep the market value of that bond at par, at par value. Now you see the natural tendency for the rate of interest is to fall as the bond is approaching maturity. It was issued, say, for 30 years, and then as time passes, it gets closer and closer to maturity. So the possibility is that the 
market value of the bond will change. Well, in this case, it would increase. But anything onward could happen, and the opposite is also possible, that the value of the bond issued by this private company will fall. And that means losses for the bondholder. Now, I use the word self-respecting company. You would use the word an honest company, and I wouldn't quarrel with that. Would have the sinking fund to enter the market if the value of the bond falls below par value, which means that, for instance, a $1,000 bond is quoted at 9 hundred and fifty dollars. Could happen and happen very often. Then the sinking fund manager enters the market and buys the bond, thereby bringing up its market value and he will stop when he brought it back to par, which is one thousand, you see. So the market would know that this is what is happening and the market would help the sinking fund manager, the speculators would say, well, sure, if this bond is going to go back to a thousand, I can benefit by buying before the sinking fund manager does. So actually, it's not as difficult as it sounds for the sinking fund manager to make sure that the bond price is not going to fall way below its par value. So that's what we call honesty. This is a good way of doing business. Now when it comes to government bonds, the situation was a little different. <laughs> because the government made an implicit promise in the case of the Scandinavian governments in, in Europe, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and some others, they made an explicit promise that in the case of a general fall, uh, a general rise, sorry, general rise in the rate of interest, which translates into a fall in bond values, they will refinance the government debt, the entire government debt, so that it was an explicit guarantee that bondholders will not get hurt, they, they will not uh, face a loss. And in this they did nothing more than obeying the scriptural uh, uh, commandment that thou shalt not torture widows and orphans. Because it was <laughs> because it was understood that most of the holders of government bonds were widows and orphans. The father died early and left the widow and the orphans, and they could not face the music out there in the rough marketplace. They needed protection. And it was incumbent on the government to give them that protection by issuing government bonds which had this implicit or explicit promise that the government that will be refunded and orphans and widows will not suffer losses. Now that is the theory under assumption that there is honesty. But we know this is not what happened and in fact the government bonds became what uh, Franz Pick, a famous uh, monetary scientist, called certificates of guaranteed confiscation. <laughs> what is a government bond? He answered, a government bond is a certificate of guaranteed confiscation. And we can say that, that every single 30 year Treasury bond issued by the United States government since the establishment of the Federal Reserve System in 1913 was in fact uh, subjected to 
uh, at least partial confiscation. Because add 30 to, one, to 13, then you get to 43. So the first bond, the 30 year bond issued by the United States government, which matured after the establishment, matured in 43. Now you know that those people did not get the value what the bond, uh, what they had to pay to buy the bond. The purchasing power of the dollar in 1943 was a, a, a shadow of what it was worth in 1913. So this is what happens. The yield curve under the gold standard assuming honesty, and of course there were dishonest operators too, but they were easy to spot. That's a difference, because the government was not among them. The government, at least, as far as its pledges and so on was concerned, uh, tried to keep the promise. So the yield curve is more like a straight line. Mm. Whatever the interest rate is under the gold standard, it is stable. Now, strictly speaking, there will you will have minor variation. But this feature is missing, and any kind of spikes up or down were missing. And that is the mistake people make about the gold standard most often. They think that the gold standard will stabilize prices. Well, this is neither possible nor practical or nor desirable to stabilize prices because prices have a role to play and the variation of the price has a role to play. After all, there are new inventions which help to uh, lower prices of important merchandise and then there are natural causes which may change the price and these are desirable too that in, in the wake of a poor harvest agricultural prices go up that's desirable that's natural this is self-corrected because the price goes up then people will start economize and if the price goes down they may be more wasteful so in other words don't believe that it's the mission of a gold standard to stabilize prices. It's neither possible nor desirable. But to stabilize interest rates is, yes, it's a mission of the gold standard. And it can do it, and it has done it for a hundred years, just before uh, 1913. There was about a hundred year peace period, not exactly a little shorter than a hundred, but that's not important. But interest rates were stable. So that is possible and that is the so-called yield curve under the gold standard. And the better the gold standard is, the the more the, the more uh, this ideal is approximated. Now, you see, to straighten this curve out takes arbitrage. The sinking fund manager is doing arbitrage. He is, or this firm, his firm is, is short because they have sold the bond. But the sinking fund manager would counteract every tendency for the price of the bond to fall. So he would enter the market and buy. So going from short, going long, that's arbitrage. And this is the good kind of arbitrage. This is the arbitrage of the sinking fund manager. is good 
arbitrage, because I'm going to talk about bad arbitrage as well. <clears throat> but there is another possibility for doing arbitrage, and this I'm going to call illicit interest arbitrage. And the, what I call here the normal yield curve gives you uh, an opportunity to do this. So you have this yield curve, and this is the rate of interest corresponding to the length to maturity, time to maturity. So uh, you know there's an inverse relationship between the bond price and the rate of interest, right? This means that if the bond price is, that, uh, sorry, this means that if the interest rate is higher, take this point, suppose this is 30 years maturity, then the corresponding bond value will be lower. Yeah. So in other words, you can buy the bond and go to, say, 10 years. And this commands a lower rate of interest. So in terms of bond values, a, third, a bond which matures in 10 years' time will be higher in value. So the bond value is higher. So you enter the market, you are a bond speculator, and you enter the market and say, I can buy 30 years at a lower price than is what is commanded by the tenure. So I buy this and simultaneously sell that. And the difference between the two bond prices is pure gravy, and I just pocket this and walk away. <laughs> as simple as that. Now, this is illicit. And I'm sorry to say I had arguments with the uh, people from the Ludwig von Mises Institute, because they say, well, if a market is to be free, then it's free. So why shouldn't a speculator be free to do this? Ah, that's the rub. Well, I tell you why. Because this, you are short on the short maturity. You sold. Okay. So that means this will mature long before the other one, the asset which compensates for this arbitrage. So then you would have to roll over your short position. And there's absolutely no guarantee that this same uh, interest rate will be available if the interest rate in the meantime falls, then the bond price goes up. So you won't be able to, I'm sorry, that, that would work. But if the interest rate goes up, then the bond price falls. So you will not be able to replace your short leg at the same cost. It will cost you more. So that ruins the arbitrage, you see. So if a lot of people do that, then there will be an effect. So let's see what this effect is going to be. If there is a lot of illicit interest arbitrage in the market, then the, the yield curve, this is not, by the way, this is natural. I'm not criticizing this because this uh, is logical, as I explained, that the longer to maturity, the, the greater the risk. So the creditors will 
have to be compensated for the extra risk they are taking when they buy the 30-year bond, and this shows up in the higher, lower, the higher rate of interest. So the, I'm not criticizing this curve. What I'm saying is that to buy the long maturity and sell the short one is illicit. It should be ruled out. It should be outlawed. Banks have been doing this on a large scale. This should be outlawed, and the bank which can't red hand it in uh, buying the long, selling the short, which also translates in banking practice. This means the bank is borrowing short and lending long. I, I think this is important enough. I want to write it down. Quotation mark borrow. short to land long. And that is just another word for illicit interest arbitrage. This should be outlawed. Why? Because what I just explained, the short leg of the straddle of the arbitrage is going to mature before the long. And in the meantime, the interest rate could move against you. And if it does, then you are, you are in trouble <laughs> because your straddle is at a loss. Now, of course, the banks know how to cover that loss. Their books are not open to the public, so they can sit on losses and wait until the long leg matures. But a loss which is swept under the rug is not a loss eliminated. It's a loss which comes back to haunt you and hit you when you least expect it. And that is what happens if a lot of banks do this, they uh, borrow short to lend long, then there will be a crisis. Now how does this crisis come about? Well, as I mentioned, when you buy the long and sell the short, that means the bond price here Let's see, here the interest rate is higher, and you buy the bond, it means the bond price will go still higher, but that means the interest will go down on the long maturity. On the short maturity, you are a, a seller. Here you are a buyer as a bank, and here you are a seller. But when you sell, that means you are pushing up the, when you are selling, you are pushing down the bond price, right? You add to the supply. So you are pushing down the bond price, which means you are pushing up the rate of interest. So here, the rate of interest is pushed down, and here it's pushed up. So how far can it go? Well, only as far as this line is reached, the console rate. So this is straightened out. So far, so good. But it's not going to stop there, because it becomes very unstable. And as a result, what was a normal yield curve becomes what is known as an inverted yield curve. And that looks something like this. The long rate is pushed down. And the short rate is pushed up. And as you get shorter and shorter, now we know this should be zero at zero. So there will be a very steep fall here. 
and this becomes very unstable. This whole situation is unstable. <coughs> so, the outcome of illicit interest arbitrage, or if you like, the outcome of the practice of borrowing short and lending long is destabilizing the interest rate structure. And the yield curve becomes inverted, and there is a crisis. Because, you know, it's illogical, isn't it, that you have to pay more for short-term borrowing in terms of interest rate than you pay for long-term. This is illogical. This is an anomaly, an aberration, a major, a cause aberration, and nature will restore the equilibrium by resolving the crisis. But that's mean, that means a lot of uh, bankruptcies and a lot of economic pain. So, what I'm saying to sum up this introduction is that the classical gold standard suffered from a great weakness, namely it did not rule out, it did not outlaw illicit interest arbitrage and as a result periodically there were crises in the money markets when the interest, uh, the yield curve became inverted and uh, a lot of this, this could be only resolved at the expense of a lot of uh, bankruptcies, uh, firms large and small uh, went bankrupt and uh, you had unemployment and so on and so forth. So this is what a gold standard has to rule out. If we are talking about the future, and we ask the question, as it is asked in the title of this talk, is the gold standard truly out of date or merely pushed aside? The answer is that the gold standard is not out of date. The gold standard had a uh, a, a, a handicap, had a, what's a better Second word for handicap? Flaws. Uh, yes. What? Weakness. Uh, flaws. We weakness. Flaws, yeah. Weakness. Uh, namely, it was, was blindfolded. It did not have a way to detect this type of market behavior by the banks. The banks were happy to do what they wanted and they found this a lucrative arbitrage possibility. And I'm sorry to say I have not been able to prevail and persuade my colleagues at the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn, uh, Alabama, that this is not a free market. The free market should outlaw this, no question asked, because this introduces an, uh, an instability into the system which will strike back, uh, not immediately, but periodically, and it will create a bad name for the gold standard, and as the old saying goes, uh, give a dog a bad name, you might as well shoot him. And that's what they did. They shot the gold standard. And that was, of course, uh, uh, worse, the, the, the worst kind of medicine because it didn't cure the problem, it made the problem worse because the, the substitute for the gold standard was irredeemable currency with zero gold component and 100% paper component which meant debt. So you create a currency which is based on negative values rather than on positive values, the gold standard does. It has positive value because the basis of the currency is gold which is a positive value. That is a negative value and it's just 
unsuitable to build a monetary system on it. So there it is. The problem exists, but it can be solved quite simply through legislation, which will outlaw uh, borrowing short and lending long, illicit interest arbitrage, and restore the sinking fund provision, which uh, is necessary not just to protect widows and orphans, but also to make the economic system and the financial system stable. So that is one way to rectify the warts of the gold standard, the classical gold standard as it existed. Now the other thing which is almost always forgotten by economists and historians, economic historians, is that the real bill market is an integral part, it's an organic part of the gold standard. I would call it the clearing system attached to the gold standard. In other words, if you think that you can have a gold standard without real bills, and I'm usually mentioning the name of Adam Smith at the same time, because he is the best source to, if you want to understand real bills, how they function and how, uh, what they are supposed to do, then uh, you read The Wealth of Nations of Adam Smith. And that's not my purpose here to uh, explain real bills, but I'm just saying this, that if you want to have a gold standard without real bills, then you are in effect castrating the gold standard. Castrating. <laughs> no better word. <laughs> and that is, ladies and gentlemen, what the victorious powers uh, tried to do after World War I. Now, uh, we, my wife Judith and I came from New Zealand. A few days ago we gave a, uh, I gave a talk at the, uh, at the fundraising event on behalf of the Ficino School in uh, Oakland, which, by the way, was very well received. The title of my talk was Forgotten Anniversary, 100 years of legal tender. This meant the event which happened in 1909 was the French government in preparing for World War I and followed very soon after by the German government, both preparing for great conflict, which was looming large on the horizon already, World War I. They introduced legislation which made the banknote issue of their respective central banks, the Bank of France in France and the Reichsbank in Germany, they had circulating banknotes, and this was made legal tender by legislation. And that me meant, in particular, that the French military and the French civil service were no longer paid in gold. Their salaries were paid in legal tender paper money. And the same in Germany. You see? So the soldiers were cut off from gold. But this was done very subtly because the banks were instructed to continue to pay out gold for uh, paper money if anybody 
demanded this, as they had the legal right before 1909, they didn't have the legal right after, but the government was careful enough to instruct the banks that you continue to pay gold to, to fool the people, because people had an implicit trust in the government. That the, this was a technical question, whether there was immediate exchange of paper money for gold, or uh, uh, the government, it was just a housekeeping change, so nothing important happened. And in fact, nobody started hoarding gold coins. They just, people trusted the government. However, no sooner World War I broke out, gold coins disappeared from one day to the other. There was no way. And of course, this was legal because they passed, the legislation was already five years old, which uh, legalized uh, the arrangement whereby the banks could refuse to pay, uh, to redeem their issues, paper money issues in gold coins. So, what was the consequence of this legal tender legislation in terms of the real bills? Well, the real bill market was killed right there and then, because there is no such a thing as a real bill maturing in paper money, as much as Ben Bernanke would love to have that. Because a paper a, a banknote is inferior to a real bill. A real bill is an earning asset. It is not only capable of circulation, as money is, but it's also an earning asset, because when you discount it, this means you sell your real bill. You, the face value is discounted by the uh, uh, number of days left to maturity. A real bill is usually maturing in 90 days. So if it still has days left to maturity, then you, when you sell it, you can get only the discounted face value. But this means that if you hold it to maturity, then it will be worth more at maturity than it is worth today. So it's an earning asset. In fact, it's the best earning asset a commercial bank can have because it's maturing into gold, yet it gives you a positive return. So as a consequence, a real bill is, for most purposes, a superior instrument to a banknote, which is not capable of earning interest. So. The idea of real bills maturing in banknotes is preposterous. It just doesn't make sense. And therefore, it wouldn't work. And it, as a consequence, the real bill market was given a stab in the back in 1909. I mean, it is still lim was limping along for a few more years, but it was obvious that it's not going to work in the long run, because if uh, paper money is legal tender, then uh, the uh, uh, holders of real bills could be refused when they demand gold at the end of uh, the maturity period. So. The, the upshot is that, which was not realized at the time, that the real bills were being phased out. Now, of course, the Great War occurred, and it was uh, bloodshed, and destruction of property, and so on. And the victors could have in principle, reestablish the real bill market at the end of the war. After the peace treaties were signed, the 
normal procedure would have been for the victorious powers to say, okay, now we go back and finance world trade with real bills uh, drawn on London. But they didn't do that. And they didn't do that because they uh, wanted to punish the vanquished, the former adversaries in the war, with more. Uh, with more uh, um, uh, in, in addition to the war reparations and so on, they wanted to hit them because the idea of real bill financing of world trade is multilateral trade. And this system was phased out and after World War I it was bilateral trade. In other words, the victorious powers, the allied powers, wanted to make sure that they control the trade of their former adversaries. And of course a multilateral system such as the market in real bills uh, would, would have avoided that and, and uh, every country could get the best terms of trade by issuing real bills. So the governments, the victorious powers wanted to retain control of the world trade and therefore they decided not to restore the uh, real bill market. However, they paid lip service to the gold standard and they said that uh, we are going to, as, far, uh, as soon as normalization can be completed, we are going to restore the gold standard. And in particular, Great Britain in 1925 uh, reintroduced the gold standard at the old rate uh, with the change that it was not the gold coin standard which existed before 1909 but it was what they called the gold bullion standard. It's a construction which goes back to Ricardo. David Ricardo came up with the idea that it's a wonderful way to economize with gold if we just don't issue gold <laughs> coins anymore, but we'll have these bricks of 400 ounce gold bars. That's, how, that's the origin, by the way. It uh, goes back to Ricardo. It goes back to, uh, sorry, 1925, when, uh, when in a large scale, uh, uh, gold would be available against paper money only in such large denominations. And uh, I, I just say this much about Ricardo, that Ricardo made a, a very, very foolish mistake. And this was then copied by Mises. Mises said that when the maturity and the uh, Bonity, what's the English word for the credibility of uh, an instrument is recognized by the market, then paper money payable in gold is an exact equivalent of a gold coin. And that was not an original idea of Mises, that goes back to Ricardo. And that's how he came to the idea of gold bullion standard, which is a great mistake, one of the greatest mistakes in the history of economics. Uh, why? Because, you see, I give you one example where the paper, however good it is or it looks, or whatever pictures yeah. you print on it, will never be acceptable in the market, the same in the same terms as gold coin, namely the marginal bondholder. He's the guy who has a gold bond, and the interest rate is falling because of illicit interest arbitrage. Whatever reason, doesn't matter. 
But if it does fall, and there will be a time when the bondholders say, enough is enough. I'm fed up with this, and I am going to sell my bond. Now remember, when interest rate falls, the value of the bond goes up. So he says, I'm going to take profit. Sell the bond. Now, he's not going to keep the proceeds in banknotes. He's not a fool. He sold because this was a protest vote on his part. And if he would accept paper money and put it in his pocket and say, I'm, fa- I'm satisfied, I registered my protest, he would be protest, he would be a fool. Because he w- would have jumped from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> the, he accepted a, an inferior instrument which earns zero percent in exchange for something which earned a low but still positive interest. So in other words, the marginal bondholder, when he's registering his protest, he's selling his gold bond and puts the proceeds into gold coins. And he's not going to be fooled by any propaganda on the part of government or banks or the economist profession because he will hang on to the gold coin as long as it takes to bring back the interest rate to his, uh, to his time preference rate. And Mises was a great economist and he did a lot of work on interest rates and in fact, in fact the time preference, but he was blind. He did not see that uh, in his theory time preference is just a pious wish that we wish interest rates should go back. But what is, the, what is it going to take to put it? You have to have teeth to do that. And it's the gold coin which is the teeth. The, gold, the marginal bondholder sold his bond, he hangs on to his gold coin, and then as a consequence interest rate will have to keep creep back And when he does, he buys back his bond at a lower rate. So he makes a profit. Now, if you take gold coins away and say, okay, it's a 400 ounce buyer of nothing, then he is completely ignored. And uh, this is just a way to get around time preference. It will never, it will not work ever after. Brilliant. And that's the mistake of David Ricardo, and it's the mistake of Ludwig von Mises. And I'm sorry, I respect the man. He was a great. He was probably the greatest economist of the 20th century. But he made a mistake, and I'm not going to shut up just because some people in Alabama. <laughs> So there it is. You have uh, you have a gold standard which they try to the uh, allied powers, the victorious powers after World War One, try to restore the gold standard. But it was a castrated gold standard because its clearing system, the, the real bill market, was not allowed to be reestablished and therefore it had to die, and it did die. So it was not out of date or whatever, it was a sabotage. The gold standard was sabotaged, first in 1909 and again in 1925 when Britain and a large part of the trading world went back to gold, but it was just limping along and it should have been clear that it's going to collapse, and it did. In 1931, Britain suspended the gold standard, and in 1933, Roosevelt in America, just a few days after he was uh, inaugurated as the new president, he 
confiscated the gold coins of the... He was emboldened by the bad example which the European government set. So this is what happened. That's the true story. Now, you won't read about it in history books or in economics. Uh, textbooks because they are covering up that story, but that is the true story. The gold standard did not die a natural death, it was sabotaged, it was killed, it was stabbed in the back. And it is still a valid theory, and it's most unfortunate that we have today this uh, split in the hard money camp uh, that we cannot agree what type of gold standard we want if uh, the coming collapse will wipe out the large part of the world's working capital because it will, uh, it will happen. And the lucky thing is that the value of gold will not be wiped out. You consolidate the, the all the balance sheets of the world of the governments and private uh, enterprise and everything, and then through mutual cancellation, the paper uh, indebtedness will disappear. That will cause a lot of suffering. People will lose uh, their wealth. But the pay the gold is not the liability of anybody. So whatever gold exists is going to survive that holocaust. And as it does, it is our hope that there will be a recovery. The world will not die because of this collapse, but using gold, and uh, there is a regenerating effect, and the world economy could, could uh, uh, be restarted. That's our hope. Now, if we cannot agree among ourselves what kind of gold standard we want, then uh, how can we convince the world? There is a huge educational problem. We have to convince the, after brainwashing of of 75 years, starting with Keynes and others, and Friedman and the rest of them. How can we convince the world that this is the way to go if we cannot agree the hard money movement? We cannot agree what kind of gold standard we want. They keep talking about 100% gold standard. And anybody who would say, well, wait a minute, real bills are needed in order to have a clearing system. They would say, you are a dirty inflationist, <laughs> shut up, you know, and, uh, on, the, on these terms, what, what can we expect? So this is, this is most unfortunate, but at least I wanted to s straighten the record that the gold standard had its uh, blemishes, but they were not fatal, they could have been removed and they should be removed, and, and hopefully that will be the way out of the present crisis. So uh, how is time? Um, you're, you're off, but we're going to open the floor to questions. Okay, all right. Well, that's basically what I wanted to say on this subject. Thank you. Before we take any questions, I just want to say that uh, this last lecture is absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, he went to the heart of the matter. Um, the professor has a background in this that's rooted not only in experience, but in, in academic inquiry, and has weighed in his mind, and, and we're all, I especially, professor, am indebted to you for what you brought mm -hmm. to us today. Um, all right, any of the questions are, before? yes. If we accept that central banks rule the governments, wouldn't it be like asking turkeys to vote for Christmas to do anything other than have printing presses? He's, he's saying that if we are going to assume that central banks run the governments, is, asking, is expecting substantive change from central banks 
futile? Will it, can it come from central banks? I, I don't think the relation is so simple between government and central bank. What is clear to me is that the banking system as a whole, on the one hand, and the government and the other, have an unholy alliance. You see, you stretch my back, I stretch yours. The banking system guarantees that the government will always be able to sell its bonds, no matter how much it will be absorbed. Because if the uh, private parties don't buy it, then the central bank and the banking system will absorb it. And as a, as a compensation or as a, in exchange, what do the banks get out of the deal? They, uh, get, uh, they get free hand. You see, they don't have to keep a gold reserve. They keep a reserve which the government uh, prints. So uh, th this means that, it doesn't mean that the governments will never go bankrupt. Because as we know, the government can pull the plug and then they disappear. This means free banking. <laughs> <laughs> if you like that kind of thing. So uh, the banking system has another advantage because there is a double standard here. You see, the banks get away with uh, things which you as a private individual under contract law cannot do, you see? And, and uh, the accounting standards can be twisted for the bank. If, if the banks are not able to pay, the government can uh, declare a bank holiday or uh, they have other fancy names for that. They uh, have standstill uh, and whatever. So, uh, this is an unholy alliance, but the relationship between the government and the central bank could take various forms. Uh, the, the, if you look around different countries, you will see all kinds of stripes and shapes of arrangement uh, from fully independent central banks. Now, you can question just how fully, fully yeah. that is. <laughs> But, uh, you know, outright nationalization of the central bank, which takes away all initiative and all authority from the central bank. And uh, therefore, I don't think this is going to lead very far if you approach the inquiry. I think the best uh, way to characterize a gold standard is that it's an arrangement whereby it's the people who create the money and not the banks. And what this means is the government opens the mint to gold and silver. So anybody, any individual citizen can take either old gold in the form of old jewelry or new gold, which was just mine, take it to the mint and convert it into the coin of the realm. What will happen to Brondo? <laughs> now that means that it's not the banking system which creates money because the banking system has to get the gold from the individuals and then they have to keep a gold reserve so they then go on and uh, they put out their credit and this credit is based partly on gold, partly on, on real bills. But they are servants, they are not the boss. And that is the only way to ensure that it, the people, the consumers, are in the driver's seat. There's no other way. Any kind of artificial arrangement uh, between the central bank and the government. It's not going to work. The government has only one role to play in this. It has to make sure that the gold coins are not fake coins. Uh, so they have to guarantee the, uh, the purity and the weight and so on. And they have to have an uh, have to give unconditional right to the individual to convert gold into the coin of the realm, or vice versa. If somebody thinks that there's too much money in circulation, he should be able to do something about it. 
What? Well, he should be able to melt down the coin or export it or do whatever he wants with it. This is, this is his birthright. So if anybody thinks there's too little money, he should take the gold to the mint and if enough people do that, there will be more money, and vice versa. He, you know. So that's a self-equilibrating mechanism which works. It worked in the past and it would work in the future. Any compromise on that is going to backfire. So the United States Constitution does say something about the mint, yeah. but it does not say anything about the federal Reserve system or central bank or whatever. It's evolution. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, question? Um, so you said that uh, under a gold standard, the uh, price price stability is not guaranteed. Um, I beg to differ. On there is one price which is guaranteed to be stable, and that's the price of money, which is what interest rates are. So that's you know reasonable. So it, it concurs with what you're saying. But my question is more to do with the um, inversion of the yield curve that you talked about. Um, the query is, would permanent backwardation uh, translate to an inverted yield curve? That's a question, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I think the two, two concepts are different. Uh, the two, two concepts are different. Um, well, first of all, the rate of interest is a more general concept because it exists both under gold standard and exists under paper money standard. Whereas backwardation uh, enters the picture only in, under the regime of uh, irredeemable currency, paper money. There's, there's no gold backwardation under the gold standard because the, the, uh, there was no future market for gold. Uh, referring to the current situation, the current regime of irredeemable currency, so the, the context of the inverted yield curve would only, in this question would only exist under the current system rather than under gold standard. I think he's asking the question, if you have a gold standard, is it possible to have an inverted yield curve? Oh, no, no, that's, no, not, that's, not, that's question. not it. That's not my question. My okay. question is, under the current system of irredeemable currency, um, we obviously have witnessed inverted yield yeah. curves in that system. Now, I have. Um, and if that can happen, is there a translation or some kind of correlation between the permanent accommodation which we, will, we may enter into, possibly looks like we will, um, and also at that same time uh, an inverted yield curve eventuating in that situation? Um, uh, the inverted yield curve is a perennial uh, uh, cyclic event. It, uh, if you Ask the question during the past 50 years how many times it has occurred. Uh, uh, you can look up the. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, but there was no gold backwardation. So the, the two things are, are just different. No, 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 well, not so much gold backwardation, but permanent backwardation. Well, just, the, the, even just, more so. Okay. There hasn't been, now, it's another question, and maybe it's a very good question, a searching question, whether the period, a periodic occurrence of inverted yield curve can give us a little advance notice that we are approaching permanent recordation. I would have said, a couple of years ago, I would have said, yes, this is a good clue. But, um, uh, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but I, I, I did not notice any inversion uh, prior. Rate. Right now, it's not inverted, and the last inversion was quite some time ago. So, uh, but it could change, it could come back, and then it could be, 
uh, a very frequent occurrence. Yes, I but uh, but uh, no, no, I, I hadn't worked on that problem, and uh, it may be a, a worthy problem to work on. So why not take a shot at it? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, Marcus, do we have time for one more? Okay, yeah. Louis. This is quite uh, pioneering stuff uh, that you're presenting to us. Uh, I just want to make sure I, I understand uh, what, what you propose as being the gold standard. Well, the first part is that the, the paper money is redeemable in fixed weights of, of gold. That's accepted by everybody in every version of the gold standard. But then there's the real bills. We have to have a real bill system and a clearing system. Uh, and the government mint has to be open to the public so that on demand they can be, uh, they can bring. Unlimited. 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 No edge. And finally today you seem to have brought another aspect which is that we, you know, for the gold standard to operate successfully, that illicit uh, interest rate arbitrage, which is really what banking is. <laughs> The, actually, uh, the, this is not quite so, because uh, Adam Smith has explained it very, very clearly that uh, he created the concept of, of social circulating capital as opposed to fixed capital. So uh, fixed capital is buildings and uh, tools with which to manufacture things. But a very distinct concept is the circulating capital. This is the mass of merchandise at various stages of production and distribution. So merchandise go through a process of maturing into the ultimate uh, ready for market uh, consumer goods, which are ready for sale. Now, if you confine the period to 90 days, then any bill drawn on this merchandise moving to the market, to the ultimate gold-paying consumer, will assume a, a, a different quality it can circulate as money, but it has a, a limited circulation because in 90 days it will end, that, that privilege will disappear. And that means that the merchandise was sold to the ultimate consumer. So, but in the meantime, this is like a river flowing and emptying into the ocean. The ocean is the consumption. Okay. So the banking system, uh, now let's put it this way. Adam Smith says that the economy would work pretty well without banks. No banks, whatever. Because the real bill can finance the movement of the social circulating capital from the primary producer to the uh, ultimate consumer. However, there's still room for the banks because the, the bank can replace the real bills with its own credit which is highly recognizable and highly uniform. For, for one thing, these real bills come in odd denomination. And it's inconvenient that you have to calculate their value every day <laughs> and recalculate it tomorrow because they are maturing. And as they do, they are an appreciating asset. It's inconvenient. So it's very convenient to have banknotes. And the banknotes have standard. They are highly recognizable. You don't have to be an expert to say, to see how good this real bill is. Because a real bill could 
be a counterfeit. So somebody pretends that he has the underlying goods moving when either they don't exist or if they do, they are not moving but they are in speculative stores because the guy thinks that the, the, there will be scarcity for some reason and then he will make a quick buck on, on his speculation. This is illicit, it's not allowed. But you have to be an expert to, to judge. Now, when it's a banknote, it's, uh, it's safer if we have honesty in the system. So, in other words, the, uh, the, the model of Adam Smith does allow for banks which avoid illicit interest arbitrage. When the bank puts in its portfolio real bills, then it can issue banknotes. However, when the banknote comes back to the bank, then he will, the bank, it's incumbent on the bank to withdraw an equal amount of, uh, uh, sorry, when he, the bank issues the banknote, he has to withdraw the real bills and put it in portfolio, and vice versa. You see, that's legitimate, completely legitimate, and this is a great service to society. It makes trade easier, financing trade uh, relatively easy, and it's crisis free. Crisis comes in because of the illicit interest. So, uh, there is such a thing as good banking, and it doesn't have to be 100% gold standard, uh, because as I say, the bank has the best uh, earning asset in the form of real bills. <laughs>